Welcome to this week's episode of Promising Young Surgeon. This week, we tackle a topic that's vital to the growth and development of every medical trainee, feedback. Feedback is a cornerstone of medical education, both giving and receiving it. It's how we learn, improve, and ultimately become the best doctors possible. But the culture around feedback and granularly how we approach it, how we receive it, that can be tricky. Whether it's unclear expectations, lack of constructive criticism, lack of any feedback at all, or excess of nonspecific negative feedback, the barriers are all very real and can significantly impact the learning process. In today's episode, we'll look critically at the current feedback system for medical trainees at all levels, medical student, resident, and fellow. We'll explore how it's historically been delivered, ways it falls short, and kick around ideas on how to improve it. Feedback is a powerful tool, and when used effectively, can truly help shape the next generation. We have a special guest today, Dr. Paul Tran, who is very passionate about medical education and feedback culture. Allow me to introduce him. Dr. Paul Tran is a pediatric gastroenterologist at Phoenix Children's. He obtained his medical degree from University of Colorado, followed by pediatric residency at Children's Health, University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas. He then completed a PEDS GI fellowship at Children's Hospital Colorado. He has presented research on feedback in procedural education and medical student curriculum at national conferences. Outside of the hospital, Dr. Tran enjoys spending time with his wife and two sons, as well as one on the way, and exploring the local aquarium and going book hunting. A really fun fact about Paul is that he was a competitive figure skater for 10 years, and he moved to Colorado Springs to train. He started doing corny raps for fun back in medical school and continued those through residency, where he was sometimes called the rapping resident. Paul, I love that you have lived so many lives. And I love your content. You know, in your videos online, you're able to get across so many accurate, but these nuanced portrayals of medical training. And they're hilarious because they're true. One of my favorite tropes that you do is where the medical student is like standing alone in a parking lot at a new clinical rotation. They're just trying locked doors. There's no other cars in the parking lot. You know, they're checking their email to see if they're in the right place. That's... That is something uh, that is really easy to do because it's such a shared universal experience (laughs) that, uh, you know, it's like, oh, just act like, uh, you know, the hundred times that it happened to you. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But what's really cool and like I admire this about you, I'll tell you right off the bat. I know a lot of people where they finish residency and or fellowship, you know, they're at the end of their training and they become an attending. And it is as if something just magical happens to them, like a magical transformation. Now they're an attending. They know nothing of what it was like to be a child, be a learner, be a student, or even be, you know, like a medical student looking for this. And so I just really appreciate, it sounds like you still very much do carry that with you. I know I carry that with me and that helps me relate to a lot of this content more and still live in that space pre-attending life. Yeah, I I think, you know, I don't think it's for lack of trying from a lot of people. I think it's a system that really beats it out of you. It's the day-to-day, the workload that's just piled on top of you and the, you know, before you learn the ability to say no to things, which everyone says is the one of the biggest things you have to learn as a new attending, it it really is just kind of like I it's not that I don't care. It's just I don't have time or energy or even the presence of mind to be able to um, to be able to devote. And then it just kind of starts slipping away a little bit. But like for me, it's, I mean, I think you alluded to it. I, I kept promises to myself when I was a med student as, as a resident and then as a fellow, like I will never be like this. The people who were antagonistic or the people who really turned me off to, to medicine and medical education. I was like, I'll never be like that. The people who inspired me, the people who invested in me, I promise I will be like that for someone else. I just hold those promises really, really, really close to my heart. I love that so much. That's, that's a very well articulated 
you know, kind of argument for it. And I can identify with that in the sense that I remember being an intern, a junior resident. And when we had issues with like senior residents who were antagonistic or bullying juniors and things like that, part of the rhetoric was, oh, you'll see how hard this job is when you become a chief. Like you're going to, you think that you're better than this, but you'll also be a monster when you get here and you'll see, and you'll be, you know, crawling back in a few years. And I was able to keep some promises to myself similarly in the sense that I did not become like that. And I really like, I made conscious effort not to just parrot out certain words that were used against us, you know, when we were earlier on in training, because unfortunately, and we know from the biosocial theory of behavior, like it is tempting, like it definitely, we, especially when we're on autopilot, we can just behave the way that's been modeled for us, especially if it has just been, you know, beating you over the head with it. I'm so appreciative to you for coming on to really talk about feedback culture and just kind of turn this inside out, look at it from multiple angles today and arm people with maybe a better perspective on how to give and receive feedback. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity and thanks for inviting me on. It, it really means a lot to be able to talk about this that I think people don't know people don't know about it. People don't um maybe some people don't care about it and then I think some people don't hear about it because it's going to the wrong people. It's like so giver centric and not receiver centric in some areas. So um, yeah, it's exciting to be able to talk about. All right. Perfect. Well, to jump in, I would love to hear more about your personal experience as a recipient of feedback throughout your medical training. And I'd love to hear, you know, just a couple pearls or stories from when you were a medical student, a resident, and a fellow, you know, selections from whatever you think really helps illustrate good or bad feedback. Yeah, I think there are several examples that come to mind. One of the things that I've shared a lot on social media um, is this story of the classic story of you get feedback, not to your face, but well beyond or after your rotation. And it happened on OB, which was a very hot and cold rotation for me. I had some of my most memorable experiences and the best teaching on OB, which I've shared And then I also had a chief resident who didn't really give me the light of day at all as a student who was new to the surgical environment. I came in, had no idea what get the numbers mean. And my first interaction on day one as a brand new medical student after like very little experience and training um, in procedure was told, hi, uh, you can talk to the sub I get the numbers. And I sat down and I was like, I don't quite know what that means. And, you know, you're tentative, you're, you're in a new environment. Like, was that supposed, was I supposed to know that? Was that something that was in orientation that I missed? Talking to this fourth year med student who's doing an away rotation, who's supposed to be on my side, right? They're, they're a fellow medical student and, and they look at me and say, just get the numbers. And it's just, I'm like this culture, right? Like she was echoing the chief resident and this chief eventually gave me feedback at the end of my rotation, never to my face that one day that week when I was in the OR and the entire team was humming and singing and like, and I'm not, I'm not like, I'm trying to, not be like, you know, extra. I'm trying to like keep a low profile, but then everyone's doing it. So jumping in with everyone else, well, that apparently made me seem uninterested in the procedure that was going on. Um, And, uh, you know, this was six weeks later and I just wish that had come in person. I just wish, you know, kindly, the, the kindest way would have been, hey, I want to give you a complete heads up. Um, It's really easy to jump into the team culture and um, we feel like you're a part of the team. Just want to caution you. Some people might think, hey, this is a a chance for you to really dive into the medicine, the surgery, the, the 
um, anatomy. You know, this is your time with the attending to, to really show that you know what's going on or, or be interested. So don't, don't waste that opportunity. Something like that. Anything. Or even telling me in person, like, hey, just don't do that anymore. Like, we don't yeah, want med it students. It bothered me. Oh, <laughs> like, yeah. 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 It bothered me. Like, your singing sucks. <laughs> like, whatever it is, um, tell me in person. Um, I got it on eval later on. And, and know, I really love that. Yeah. It, it highlights for me, and I don't mean to interject, but it just it, it highlights for me how important it is for really the people who are providing feedback to just be cognizant of their surroundings. Because here's the thing is, everybody wants something different out of you when you're a student or an observer or a shadow or, you know, whatever level you are at coming into something like the operating room. I have literally heard both sides of this. I have heard the situation where say there's a medical student, they are being very quiet, very respectful. The rest of the team is kind of humming. They're getting into the music. They're talking a little bit conversationally. The medical student's just stoic. Well, guess what? Then they're like, this person's not really fun and maybe too serious, maybe too stoic. But I've seen the person who gets in humming and then I've heard the attendings or you know senior residents say, this person is too comfortable. Why are they so cocky? Why do they, you know, like what's with all the humming? And so it's almost like a lose-lose. And it's important for all of us to talk openly about that so that we don't feel as badly if a loss happens. Right. And, you know, I think there's, we could go down so many rabbit holes. But one of the things that when I talk about this now in retrospect, with the, the lens of the growth mindset, what could I take away from that opportunity? What I could take away is something else that an attending in fellowship told me. Similarly, the way I act in the OR in an environment, the endoscopy suite that I feel very comfortable with is calibrate. Don't change your personality, but calibrate to your surroundings. You don't quite know what the expectations are when there's a new team and a new environment. You don't know quite know what the existing culture is. So, so it's okay to come back a little bit towards the middle. <laughs> if you're a naturally enthusiastic, loud, dancing, full personality person, don't suppress that, but see what the middle is a little bit and, and calibrate to your surroundings. And I think that was, at least contextually for me, very important to hear. In the growth mindset with that frame, I can think, okay, you know what? From now on, I want to make sure, maybe I need to clarify some expectations a little bit of what is decorum, what is expected um, within an environment, um, and know that that's not a reflection on me. If someone disagrees with the way that I'm acting there and I don't think it's unprofessional or like, you know, disrespectful in some way, I, okay, I, I appreciate that. That's a reflection on how I was acting. In that moment, not a reflection on my character or identity as a person. Um, and I think, you know, when I was a student, that hit way harder. That, was, I, that hit with, I had such anger of like, how dare you? You know, how dare you? And then, you know, you also realize that, you know, sometimes people are struggling more with not getting feedback at all than getting any negative feedback now. And it's like, at least you got feedback. <laughs> um, and someone said, um, I forgot which author, but the feedback's a gift and you just, there are bad gifts. There are gifts that you have want nothing to do with. There are really good ones that you can't wait to use. Feedback's a gift. You decide what to do with it. Um, and, and like, I think, I think that's kind of part of, the mentality shift a little bit of how we can view the feedback we get. And I love that. And I definitely want to dive deeper into the growth mindset for sure. Like I'm newer to this whole school of thought, but absolutely like it's transformative. Um, I do think that it's interesting when we do delve deeper into the growth mindset, I would love to hear your advice because I think that in my personal experience, I was at a malignant residency training program and it was just harrowing. Like I, I was suicidal for maybe half of my fourth year. Mm -hmm. And so it's very difficult for a person in that place. And I was suicidal as a 
pretty direct result of my surroundings in that mulling network environment. You know, mm. that's even what, when I then got ho- hooked up with therapy, that's what the therapist was saying. They were like, no, I, I don't think you have a personality disorder. I don't think you have a psychiatric disorder. We're going to chalk this one up to like acute stress disorder related to your work surroundings and the mm-hmm. dynamics in your workplace. Um, so it's very hard for that person to kind of see the light or even be able to make the jump into the growth mindset. Like it took me time and significant decompression post residency to even access a place where I could be healed, you know, with effort to where I could get into the growth mindset. But before we jump into that, because I definitely, you know, like you're one of the thought leaders on this. I want your answer. I want you to tell me so that I can like go back in time and fix myself, you know, like I'm asking for me, but also for any of our listeners who can identify with that. Like sometimes the environment is just that malignant, but, um, when I loved the quote that you shared and it reminds me of, I'm in a writer's round table, um, for, for my book and my, my work as a physician writer. And what I love is that, the leader has this policy on feedback, like the structure for how we give and receive feedback. It's quite strict, which I like. I think everyone appreciates it because then it helps the round table. You know, there's like 10 of us in there and it keeps it very tight, very respectful, very professional because day one, he said, these are the parameters for feedback. It's very literal. So this person reads their work. You can then say your feedback to them, say something that you liked about it. Like we can all do that there, you know, I would question your imagination if you can't even like find one nice thing to say. So (laughs) figure that out. And then you can Mm -hmm. say that I thought maybe this could be cleaner. I thought that maybe you were telling, not showing in this part and then give specifics and then that's it. And so your feedback has been given and here's what the recipient has to do. The recipient just says back their understanding. So they just say, Awesome. Thank you so much for the feedback. I heard that you liked when this character said this. I heard that you said that you thought it could be cleaner at this paragraph. And then that's the end of the interaction. It's like very pleasant. It's very transactional. It's very clean. There isn't emotion attached onto it, which commonly can happen, especially in a high stress hospital setting and things like that. But I love that it's just like, don't defend yourself. There are really strict rules for what the recipient can say. And they can't mm. be like, well, I know you think that it could be cleaner, but like, I didn't want it to be cleaner for this reason. It's actually going to serve a purpose. I'm setting up something totally different. Like you missed the theme. No, the rule is don't explain yourself because here's at the end of the day, congruent with what you're saying, you decide if you take that feedback or not. So you, the author, it's no problem either way. All you're doing in this structured environment is acknowledging that you got the feedback, say your understanding of it, because there could always be a little misunderstanding, but you know, then take it or leave it. Absolutely no problem at all. And that's kind of like the agreement that we enter into. Yeah. I, I think that's, I think that's great. You know what, that, what that in a meta way, what that shows that's such an important part of a feedback conversation is expectation or our expectations, both of the feedback conversation itself. What is the expectation of the structure of it? And also what is the expectation for like the, like the content of the feedback? I think um, I gave, I gave a grand rounds presentation on feedback, kind of a a scoping overview. And one of the comments, because I talked about goal setting, one of the comments from the residents that I just really appreciated, and I was like, I need to implement this immediately, was it's really hard to to set goals. And I said, goals are are really what you need to to give relevant, specific feedback. But it's really hard to set goals if I don't know what the expectations are for me at my current level, or even what I aspire, what expectations should be if I, to an aspiring level. And I like this because it's like, you know, the expectations of the conversation are this. And then you could also bring in, you know, the expectations that you've uh, like agreed upon beforehand. So, uh, or have been pre laid out. So um, yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah. It really like, you know, with my background and my personal experience and training, 
I was not extremely hot on the roundtable model or really receiving feedback because I've been burned a lot before. And like this really, it, it absolutely like all emotions taken out of it. I've, I don't think I've seen anyone respond in a reactive way. It doesn't get me reactive in any sense, but I think that it also, it does show that the buy-in needs to be kind of from both parties. I mean, um, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how a person who is like really actively struggling can kind of bridge that gap into the growth mindset or being able to shift to being more open to feedback in real time. Um, and it may be, you know, a miracle is the answer. No, I, I, so one, uh, I appreciate your kind words, by the way, I wanted to jump. I almost jumped when you said I'm a thought leader in this. I am a mere po- echo of much, much smarter people. My favorite author right now is Adam Grant. Um, He's an organizational yeah. psychologist at Wharton. And just this, he is truly incredible at, at things that should be, apl- we should be applying to medicine and medical education. Mm-hmm. And he brought up this idea that um, asking for feedback makes people into critics. Uh, what feedback do you have for, for this writing? I'm going to critique it. And I'm going to be a critic and go through. Whereas asking for advice turns people into coaches. I'm going to coach you now. So one of the things that I think is really, really amazing is so that you got the Benjamin Franklin effect, where um, if you ask someone to do you a favor, they're more likely to do you favors rather than the thought of like, well, if I do them a favor, they owe me one. And And similarly... When you ask for advice, what you're doing is, I think, elevating that person, that person's stature in, in like their mind for what you perceive. So like, if I'm asking you for advice, in some part, it means that I trust you. Uh, if I'm asking for it from a actually authentic place, not just, well, I know I or should pretending ask to trust. Yeah, yeah. Or pretending to trust you. Yeah, right. Like, if I'm asking you truly for advice, I trust what you have to say. I'm going to trust that you uh, could actually help me in this situation. And then conversely, you invest in me a little bit. When you give me advice, you want your advice to pan out. You Because my advice did good. My advice was valuable and was worth something. So and And also, I've invested in you. If I'm continuing to give you advice over time and you're succeeding... Maybe in part, it's because of my advice. So I also get some benefit from this. So um, I think moving into the growth mindset too and using feedback as a gift, when you ask for advice, like truly it's like, I think it's a lot easier to say, well, that was bad advice. I'm not going to use it. Or I thought that this was amazing advice. I want to share it with everyone else. Framing it from feedback into advice helps with that situation too. Like, this is really a gift. Mm -hmm. Like, Mm -hmm. I, I love your advice. You have, you give really good advice. I'm going to implement and use your advice more often, or you give really crappy advice, man. I, I'm maybe going to stop giving you advice or maybe you're like the in-law who comes sometimes and, and, uh, you know, um, by the way, this is not my in-laws. I love them. They're amazing. (laughs) But like some in-laws come in, you see on TV and it's like, you know, like lots and lots and lots of uh, advice that you're like, I unsolicited, unwarranted and unappreciated advice. So, um, yeah, that's one love that. practical way to frame it. And it does feel like that that I, you know, if I can use my own like neurotic sensitive mind as like you know the focus group for your advice like i feel like that that would pass the test because it seems like reframing in that way with that perspective it could have the effect of giving anyone a thicker skin which like at the end of the day that's part of what i want all of us to learn is like just basically glean different superpowers to get a really thick skin i think that that is a huge asset to any physician, you know, any person in training, literally any person. But I guess that I will tell just a funny story. This is some like fairly uh, formative feedback that I got. 
I guess I haven't been able to make a ton of sense one way or another out of it, but like it, it's a good thought experiment. When I was a third year medical student, I already knew I was applying in ENT and now, you know, time was flying. So I needed to just try to get ahead of the curve with mock interviews. My mentor very kindly, this was a research mentor of multiple years. He set me up with the chair of the department for a mock interview at that institution. Um, so this is like a big deal. You know, I was an M3. I was kind of a gunner back then. I was like mm -hmm. very hype. I was like, I got to get all my ducks in a row. Had my CV, had like my pitch of myself. And I, I was very excited about this. Day finally comes, you know, I walk into his office and he gestures at the table. You know, we sit at the table together. And I was like, thank you so much for taking the time. You know, wonderful to meet you. Really appreciate this. And he was like, yeah, so go, go ahead, start. Mm -hmm. And I said, hi, well, my name is Francis May Harden. I'm born and raised in Chicago. I went to a boarding high school. And he literally is like, I'm going to stop you there. And I was like, oh. And I, I was sitting there and I was like, oh, yeah, what's up? And he said, the content of what you're saying is fine. It's whatever. But your voice, you have this low glottic voice that is impossible to listen to. And I don't know how you can fix that, but I recommend that you try before you go on the interview circuit. Hmm. I said, totally understand. Thank you so much. And that was the end of the interaction. I left the office and like cried the entire walk home. Wow. Of course, that was a laryngologist. So, like, those people are more inordinately tuned into voices than other people. But, like, you know, I, I like – so in terms of does your test – you know, your advice passes the test in the sense that that guy, he literally did give very bad advice. Like, yeah. so he gave bad advice. It's much easier for someone to say, you know what, I had high hopes for that. I really was looking for mentorship. He gave bad advice and, you know – I'm good with leaving that as what it was versus, you know, I built this up to be like an awesome thing. I tried really hard. I tried my best and basically felt struck down by a potential mentor or an opportunity to learn how to interview better or present myself better. I mean, whoa, that's like, I mean, almost kind of like a, is it a backhand slap? Is it a, is it a forehand slap in that moment? And my first, you know, th that's my gut instinct. Well, as you're telling me the story, I, I think of two responses and I would not have been in a place to do this then. This is as a, as a third party listening to the story with what I know now, but using that test, using this response and this mindset, thank you so much for telling me that. That's honestly, that's something I've heard before. So it may be the blind spot. Um, is there, is there, what advice would you give me to work on my intonation otherwise? Like, do you have any other advice to do that or how to address that? Because, you know, I certainly don't want, I don't want another laryngologist to be turned off by it. You know, that's, uh, that, that's one. Or if you're like truly, cause in that moment, if you're like, bro, I can't do anything about that, right? Like, like, come on, we're in interview season or whatever. Another response could be, thank you. Um, do you have any advice for me to make my content shine so much so that it shines and outshines this glaring deficiency that you have? Because those are things that I can change maybe I can I can change my voice, but it's going to take a lot more time and energy than, you know, than maybe some other things that you have suggestions for. And if he looks at me and he's like, or looks at you and says, uh, no. All right. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate it. That, like, um, I, it seems like that's my number one priority or you think that's my number one priority. <laughs> right? like, yeah, no, that's a great point. And Okay. So I really like that. Like, I kind of wish I could go back in time because I would be interested to know the responses to those. And it, it would be really helpful if we could have like a constructive conversation about, yes, things that make somebody outshine their like 
just hideous, unlistenable, low glottic voice. Yeah. Um, no, I'm just kidding. But that, yeah, that really is masterful. Like, I appreciate you walking me through that because, like, absolutely, I'm in. Those are both way more, I think, graceful, classy, and constructive, effective. Because, like, a lot of what we talk about on this podcast is, like, just being effective, right? Because at the end of the day, in terms of, like, do we want to be right or do we want to be happy? Like, I number three for me, I want to be effective. Like, I want to be able to get the things that I want or need done in a way that's healthy for all party and invo- parties involved. And so that's great. Yeah. That's very helpful. This was all, this was all like a prank for me to just kind of get advice <laughs> from you for uh, th- this old thing that was like bothering me. Uh, you know, it's hilarious after my, after my talk on, uh, actually I've given this talk a couple times n- without fail. People will come up after and say, what advice would you give me for, I like almost jokingly, like asking for advice and feedback, but I'm like, that's a very practical, it, it's such a practical thing and it's such a nice reframe. Um, and I will say for anyone listening who's like, okay, how do I, I practically apply this outside of, you know, an interview? What about like one of the things that we, we really are talking about or, or haven't fully talked about yet, but is like, what about like, oh, evaluations overall evaluations, like when people are giving you evaluations for your future grade, whatever, um, what advice would you give me to get to the next level is a really practical, applicable, you know, here, you, you know, it's adjacent. What advice would you give me to be a you know, otolaryngologist, uh, is it, do you go by otorhino laryngologist? Like, is there, do you put rhino in there too? I never, (laughs) and I don't know anyone in real life who does that, but like otolaryngologist, I will say that my March madness bracket every year is otolaryngologist. Oh, ballin. Okay. (laughs) I love it. Feel free. Like all the mini ENTs out there, feel free. Cause it's such a good March madness name. Oh, that's great. I, I think the I think the um, asking though like what advice would you like as a third year med student what advice would you give me to succeed as an intern as a sub I as an intern uh, what advice would would you give someone who's really wanting to be successful right away in residency you know these are things and you're thinking ahead you're like you know what and that's another way to get expectations. Like, it's kind of another way of saying, like, what are your expectations of a strong intern? This, this, this. Okay, well, guess what? I'm not an intern yet, so I can get to, I can try to get to that level before I'm there. And the specifics are so key, like what you're talking about, because that's true. Like, if somebody, even if a young trainee asked me, hey, what advice do you have for me? I guess I I might, you know, depending on the context, I'd try to give a real answer, which would be like, you know, be honest, be prompt, you know, try to anticipate problems before they come. Whereas those more specific questions, what advice do you have for me to su- succeed on a sub I? That is a very different set of advice. And I could give more concrete, you know, tips. Right, right. Like, or if I'm, I'm, if I'm rotating with you, what advice would you give me to be enough out of the way in your OR, but actively involved <laughs> right like that's that's like the common yeah. med student question to me is how do i be engaged and enthusiastic and not annoying or in the way and they ask yeah. you that oh you people, get asked that? that that is the number one question that is unasked or like in i think people on people's minds and or people who have felt comfortable enough with me, my mentees or people I just talked to that are like, okay, give it to me straight. How do, how the heck do you be enthusiastic and engaged without being a gunner, without being looked down on as a gunner and, and being annoying to the team? Cause I don't want to be annoying. I don't want to be that annoying yappy person, but I, how do you do that? How do you balance that and, and be engaged and be involved? Yeah, I love that. One, I totally agree about it being an unspoken question, but it's definitely a testament to you as a like clinical instructor that people would feel comfortable enough to ask that to you. Because agreed, I think that that's like the million dollar question that everyone's trying to suss out, and you know, 
they would pay a lot of money to figure out via underground right. channels if, if they could. But I really like this idea that someone could just say it. I mean, of course, even I have shadowers in my OR and things like that. So I think that that's, that's great. One question that I have, and you do talk about this on your page, but shifting to how you give feedback and how you combat things like what happened to you on the OB rotation in terms of like, what is timely feedback? Obviously you're a really busy attending. And so like, how do you make time for it? What does timely mean to you? And what does that process look like for your fellows? So I'll walk you through what happened today. Part of what made me run a little late, but, uh, or before then, but I was doing an endoscopy, uh, endoscopic procedure with a fella. Um, and what I do routinely is I lay the expectation out beforehand. Hey, I'm going to hold you to a high standard. And this is a, something else I got from Adam Grant. It's called wise feedback, which is the 18 words. I am giving you this feedback or this, these comments because I have high expectations, but I'm confident you will meet them. Like, that's crazy. You're building people up. I have high expectations of you, but I know it's because you can be great. And then you help them be great. So I set that expectation beforehand. Hey, do you want to be a great endoscopist when you finish GI fellowship? Heck yeah, I do. Are you sure? Yes. Do you want, do you want the feedback and the coaching to get great? Yes. I want to be great. And hearing good job is not going to get me there. Great. We are aligned. That's our goal. Well, the expectation is this. When I see something, I'm going to call it out. But then we're going to, wa- we're going to talk through the reasons why I'm saying what I'm saying. And then you filter it. If you think it's something that's like anecdotal and it's my experience and you don't feel like that's replicated by other people, it doesn't work for you, great. If you, if you feel like it's a good, that you have a good reason why not to do it, okay. Like every attending has different, different, uh, like styles, art of medicine, right? Like, and something trainees say all the time is I go into an, uh, OR endoscopy suite, whatever, 20 different attendings will tell me 20 different things. And who do I listen to? And those are called credibility judgments. You judge based on the feedback you get, how credible a giver is. But I take all this stuff and to make it practical for me as a giver, I, kind of have the discussion beforehand. It's longitudinal with my fellows and they know that I'm going to be harder now. And I've tried to be even harder because I'm like, you're about to enter independent practice and I can help you get better before because I don't have that much more time with you. So I'm going to call it out. And during the procedure, hey, I'm seeing you use your right hand a lot. And we talked about how it's better to not use your right hand, whatever. I call it out, say there, if there is a point where there is a true like egregious like oh that's timeout and i actually stole this from surgical education literature timeout pause freeze and then i say look at your hands or look where you're going or whatever instead of cognitive load instead of being like hey you got to do this this is like and make them panic and then they're trying to like look at the screen look at the patient at the same time as they're looking at their hand, whatever, pause, time out, remove that cognitive load. Say all of that. That's in the moment, and I keep it really brief. Um, in, um, in endoscopy, there's a lot of steering. So I use short language, tip up, tip down, look right, suction air, like short, sweet, like uh, very quick directions. That's not feedback. Some, some people could misconstrue that as, oh, that was feedback. I gave enough feedback. That's not feedback. Right. Feedback is immediately after. Immediately after when I have time. So we usually have to talk to, uh, as a pediatric gastroenterologist, we talk to parents. We got to do stuff. That's not the time for the feedback. I do all that stuff. And then usually in the middle of a block, I have some time until the next patient. After I consent, then we sit down and we talk. Let's debrief that procedure. What? What happened there? What was some takeaways? We debrief. We talk about it. Here's my rundown of the observation, whatever. And then we did a couple procedures today. So I did that little de- quick debrief after. And the debrief, and this seems like, oh, man, it's just too much work. This is like, 
I don't have 15 minutes. I'm like, this is 45 seconds. If like, this is short. Right. And at the end of the day, we do evaluations on MedHub. I pull up the MedHub evaluation and I pull it up for the colonoscopy procedure and I have laid out competencies in our MedHub. So not everyone has this. And if you don't, maybe you could develop it as an educator. But I have 18 different comp- competencies that I've pulled in from literature and put it there. And I go through each and every single one with a fellow. What was this? What was this? Uh, did you use air? Did you use water? Did you use suction? Did you turn? Were you able to get this landmark? Blah, blah, blah. And I asked them, if I, if I can't answer it, I say, what do you think? Uh, no, I don't think I met it. Did not achieve. Achieve, did not achieve. I pick. And then the, the three out of fives that I, uh, you know, I make fun of, well, they're competency scores. So I'm like, do you feel like you are competent at this skill? Like, do you get a, did you get a five out of five? And they might say, yeah. And I'll say, I'll tell you where I put myself. I would put myself at a four. And here's why. I think at at a five, here's my expectation. You do this. I don't think I do that regularly. So I'm at a four. So I give that framework to them. And they're like, oh, if you are at a four, and I think that you do it better than me, maybe I am at a three. You know, but we have that conversation. I go through that. And then at the very bottom, there's usually free text comment. I start typing right away as I'm talking to them. I'm like, all right, so all the things that we just talked about and the things from the procedure, what'd you take away? Um, You're overall doing much better in this. You're progressing. I can see you're actually trying to do this. Um, I told you several times about the right hand. Remember that it's improvement. uh, It improves your visibility with blah, blah, blah. Kind of making it up a little bit. I type it all out. They see it right there. I'm like, what do you think? Yeah, I'll work on this next time. This whole thing really intentionally, like the private one-on-one time and writing this all out, it can be done in less than five minutes. And next time they can look at that and actually improve. So I love to do that. And that's in the procedure unit. I do that in clinic as well. At the end of the day, when I'm in staffing fellows clinic, I try to say, hey, you know, here's some things we talk about. I always use examples. I give usually try to give one pointed piece of feedback. Like, hey, I, I really liked your use of analogies during talking with this patient. Um, I thought that, I thought that uh, you didn't give enough pause here and you kind of kept going. You got really excited about the analogy and you kept going and you didn't give them a chance to respond. So try to give a pause next time. Okay. That's, that's kind of my overall method. Sorry if it's a little bit long. That's incredible. No, no. I think that people need to hear it because it definitely, I think it's very different from anything that I've ever heard before. You know, like this isn't obviously, this is not taught to us in any formal curriculum, you know, nationally. And the issue with, one of the issues with residency training is just how heterogeneous it can be. And so, you know, I've never seen anything like that modeled. I have never received feedback, you know, in that format when we think of residency and beyond training. Um, But that's very moving. Like I'm like, you know, just, you know, to be frank, like that moves me almost to tears because I'm like, that is a really beautiful way to like think about it and to do things. And, you know, I, I just wish I want this for everyone, you know, even like what, what you had mentioned with MedHub, like, it, it would be awesome for increasing numbers of people who are in clinical education to set up like that or to even take like the the five minutes to do face-to-face feedback. Like not everyone feels like they can do it. Um, and I just, even when you talk through this, I believe you in terms of that Adam Grant 18 word and I know you can rise to this. I know you will be great and we're going to get you too great. Um, I think that that last piece is what's so important because even in malignant residency programs, I've heard the, I have high expectations thrown around with accompanied by very vague to no feedback at all and a general sense based on tone, you know, other treatment, body language, everything else about it that they do not have any vested interest in your success or not. And also, in fact, 
are not going to necessarily not kick you while you're down or like not bully a learner. Um, so I, I think that that's really incredibly helpful. I appreciate that level of detail. I think it can be modeled. You provided enough detail to where that can really make a difference. And I think it could change people's practices and be modeled um, for themselves. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I'll, I'll just say for people, people will listen. And the first thing that they say, that defensive, oh, I got that feedback and I want to respond right away. Great. I don't have even five minutes, man. Like you don't know what it's like to be a surgeon. You don't know what it's like to be this, uh, a, a professor who has this many roles. I'm like, well, eh, I, I, I would argue that I, I take on way more than I, I probably have what appears the capabilities to do. So I understand what it means to be busy and maybe I'm not as busy as you, but okay, distill it down. If you don't want to do this whole thing, it sounds too much for you. Then one thing before the wise feedback, do you want to be great? Because if you don't want to be great, okay. I, I, you know, then my expectation of you to, to hold you to great, then, you know, it's not going to land, <laughs> right? But if you want to be great, I'm going to hold you to very high expectations. So lay out the expectation and then make like, lay out whether the expectation was met or not. And then at least at the very least, the short version of that is like, Hey, I expect by your level of training to fellows to do this. And you didn't do that. I didn't see that done. And at the very least, someone hearing that could be like, interesting. Uh, I feel like I do that right now. It plants a seed of, is it because you didn't see me do it or is it because I don't really do it? That's a blind spot. And I've just assumed that I do it. Then you find it from other people. Oh, other people are noticing the same thing. Huh? That must be a blind spot for me. Or that was just one person's unreasonable expectations. Discard. Absolutely. I think that the other thing that I would just emphasize when I hear your walkthrough is that, you know, it is conceivable that on one of those metrics on MedHub that you would grade yourself as a four out of five. Just taking an honest look at yourself as a proceduralist, you know, in your practice. And that is extremely helpful because, again, speaking from various things I've seen that like aren't very effective, don't really work, right, is if the person giving feedback acts or approaches this conversation from a place of, I've always been a five out of five. I stay a five out of five, even on a bad day, five out of five on a good day, seven out of five, you know, again, like I'm a surgeon and that's a little bit of the culture that I was brought up in that makes it difficult to kind of enter this good faith two way street in terms of giving and receiving feedback. Like when you talk about the giver, the recipient gets to decide how credible or not the giver is. And one way to automatically discredit yourself is to be a seven out of five on a good day and a five out of five on a bad day. And then like, you know, and then they're anyway, they're like, you're a two, you're a worm. Like. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think uh, what, like what I heard um, and what's said in the literature a lot about coaching, which is uh, there's a lot in the surgical education literature, but in medical education, we're trying to take it from other fields. Coaches, the best coaches help their learner see their own blind spots. That's what a coach does. A coach really is different from a teacher in that if I am coaching you, I see a blind spot or a potential blind spot. I am just helping you recognize your own blind spot. So one of the things that you said in my bio, I was a figure skater. Over and over, figure skaters, like when I was skating, my elbow would be out in a jump and I wouldn't be able to land it. And my dad, who's wasn't my coach, doesn't know anything about figure skating, which is like, hey, your elbow's out. I think that's wrong. I think that's wrong. And I couldn't hear it until he showed me video and then it clicked. Oh, my elbow's out. I should tuck it in. When I tucked it in, I was landing jumps more. I then, with his coaching, was able to see my own blind spot. So coaches help learners see their blind spots. It doesn't, in, until I reflected though, and said, oh, that's a blind spot. It doesn't land. 
So you need reflection too. And what's the best way to help someone with a skill? You model that yourself. So if someone's struggling with reflection on their own, maybe you can model reflection. Hey, I know that this is an area that I need to work on. Um, So I'm going to just open up with that and be honest with that. Here's something that I see for you. You know, and then you ask for feedback in turn, you ask for advice in turn. So I think there's so many, so many strings we could pull on in in the whole conversation. Totally, totally. Well, and of course, I don't want to keep you forever, although I, I really love this and, and I've learned so much. I do want to close today with a question that we end every episode with, which is, do you believe in karma? Do I believe in karma? Yeah. And, and, and. In some extent, I think in the extent of kindness and encouragement, um, it's not that it comes around. I think it's just contagious. It's the same kindness, encouragement. It's just growing and expanding. Um, So in that sense, that's the first thing I think about. Um, When we promote cultures of kindness and encouragement, um, it, it really adds to a global and growing bank of it and whatever your milieu is. Um, so that, that, that might not be what you're asking about, but that's my first thought. No, absolutely. No, it's totally open-ended up for interpretation. And I definitely think that like everything that you have taught us about and talked about today, it definitely is like you're walking the walk with that. So sincerely, it's been so wonderful to chat with you and kick around these ideas. Um, Certainly, I'm hopeful that feedback culture and medical training will continue to evolve with conscious effort towards improvement. Where can our listeners find and connect with you online? I would say um, some stuff in the works, but uh, right now, mostly social media. uh, by my uh, my at uh, elementary school, which is my punny name, um, and and hopefully we can uh, we can continue to entertain and encourage people with just the things that we're doing. I think what you're doing is just amazing. Thank you so much. Follow me on Instagram at at francismay.md and Rethinking Residency. Visit my website, rethinkingresidency.com, to learn more about resident physician stories and ways that residents can most effectively navigate the game of residency. I look forward to connecting with you on next episode of Promising Young Surgeon. If you enjoyed today's discussion, please subscribe and leave us a review and share with any of your friends who may be struggling with giving or receiving feedback at work. If you'd like to submit any questions for future episodes, email us at pys at heyinfluent.com.